The unicorn was standing very still before the Red Bull, her head down and her whiteness drabbled to a soapy grey. She looked gaunt and small, and even Molly, who loved her, could not keep from seeing that a unicorn is an absurd animal when the shining has gone out of her. Tail like a lion's tail, deer legs, goat feet, the mane cold and fine as foam over my hand, the charred horns, the eyes, oh, the eyes! Molly took hold of Schmendrick's arm and dug her nails into it as hard as she could. You have magic, she said. She heard her own voice, as deep and clear as a sibyl's. Maybe you can't find it, but it's there. You called up Robin Hood, and there is no Robin Hood, but he came and he was real. And that is magic. You have all the power you need if you dare to look for it. Schmendrick regarded her in silence staring as hard as through his green eyes were beginning the search for his magic in Molly Grew's eyes. The bull stepped lightly toward the unicorn, no longer pursuing, but commanding her with the weight of his presence, and she moved ahead of him, docile, obedient. He followed like a sheepdog, guiding her in the direction of King Haggard's jagged tower in the sea. Oh, please! Molly's voice was crumbling now. Please, it's not fair! It can't be happening! He'll drive her to Haggard, and no one will ever see her again. No one. Please, you're a magician. You won't let him. Her fingers struck even deeper into Schmendrick's arms. Do something, she wept. Don't let him. Do something. Schmendrick was prying futilely at her clenched fingers. I'm not going to do a damn thing, he said through his teeth, until you let go of my arm. Oh, Molly said, I'm sorry. You can cut off the circulation like that, you know, the magician said severely. He rubbed his arms and took a few steps forward into the path of the Red Bull. There he stood with his arms folded and his head high, though it drooped now and then because he was tired. Maybe this time, Molly heard him mutter, maybe this time. Nico said, what was it that Nico said? I don't remember, it's been so long. There was an odd old sorrow in his voice that Molly had never heard before. Then a gaiety leaped up like a flame as he said, Well, who knows? Who knows? If this is not the time, perhaps I can make it so. There's this much of comfort, friend Schmendrick. For once, I don't see how you could possibly make any things worse than they already are. And he laughed softly. The red bull, being blind, took no notice of the tall figure in the road until he was almost upon it. Then he halted, sniffing the air, storm stirring in his throat but a certain confusion showing in the swing of his great head. The unicorn stopped when he stopped, and Schmendrick's breath broke to see her so tractable. Run, he called to her, run now! But she never looked at him, or back at the bull, or at anything but the ground. At the sound of Schmendrick's voice, the bull's rumble grew louder and more menacing. He seemed eager to be out of the valley with the unicorn, and the magician thought he knew why. Beyond the towering brightness of the, the Red Bull, he could see two or three sallow stars and a cautious hint of a warmer light. Dawn was near. He doesn't care for the daylight, Schmendrick said to himself. That's worth knowing. Once more, he shouted to the unicorn to fly, but his only answer came in the form of a roar like a drum roll. The unicorn bolted forward, and Schmendrick had to spring out of her way or she would have driven him down. Close behind her came the bull, driving her swiftly now, as the wind drives the thin, torn mist. The power of his passage picked Schmendrick up and dropped him elsewhere, tumbling and rolling to keep from being trampled. His eyes jarred blind and his head full of flames. He thought he heard Molly Rue screaming. Scrambling to one knee, he saw that the red bull had herded the unicorn almost to the beginning of the trees. If she would only try one more time to escape, but she was the bull's and not her own. The magician had one glimpse of her, pale and lost between the pale horns, before the wild red shoulders surged across his sight. Then, swaying and sick and beaten, he closed his eyes and let his hopelessness march through him until something woke somewhere that had wakened in him once before. He cried aloud for fear and joy. 
What words the magic spoke this second time he never knew surely. They left him like eagles and he let them go. And when the last one was away, the emptiness rushed back with a thunderclap that threw him on his face. It happened as quickly as that. This time he knew before he picked himself up that the power had been and gone. Ahead, the red bull was standing still, nosing at something on the ground. Schmendrick could not see the unicorn. He went forward as fast as he could, but it was Molly who first drew near enough to see what the bull was sniffing. She put her fingers in her mouth like a child. At the feet of the red bull there lay a young girl, spilled into a very small heap of light and shadow. She was naked and her skin was the color of snow by moonlight. Fine tangled hair, white as a waterfall, came down almost to the small of her back. Her face was hidden in her arms. Oh, Molly said, oh, what have you done? And heedless of any danger, she ran to the girl and knelt beside her. The red bull raised his huge blind head and swung it slowly in Schmendrick's direction. He seemed to be waning and fading as the gray sky grew light, and though he still smoldered as savagely bright as crawling lava. The magician wondered what his true size was and his color when he was alone. Once more the red bull sniffled at the still form, stirring it with his freezing breath. Then, without a sound, he bounded away into the trees and was gone from the sight in three gigantic strides. Schmendrick had a last vision of him as he gained the rim of the valley, no shape at all but a swirling darkness, the red darkness you see when you close your eyes in pain. The horns had become the two sharpest towers of old King Haggard's crazy castle. Molly Grew had taken the white girl's head into her lap and was whispering over and over, What have you done? The girl's face, quiet in sleep and close to smiling, was the most beautiful that Schmendrick had ever seen. It hurt him and warmed him at the same time. Molly smoothed the strange hair and Schmendrick noticed on the forehead above and between the closed eyes a small raised mark, darker than the rest of the skin. It was neither a scar nor a bruise. It looked like a flower. What do you mean, what have I done? he demanded of the moaning Molly. Only saved her from the bull by magic, that's what I've done. By magic, woman, by my own true magic. Now he was helpless with delight, for he wanted to dance and he wanted to be still. He shook with shouting and speeches, and yet there was nothing that he wanted to say. He ended by laughing foolishly, hugging himself until he gasped, and sprawling down beside Molly as his legs let go. "'Give me your cloak,' Molly said. The magician beamed at her, blinking. She reached over and ungently pulled the shredded cloak from his shoulders. Then she wrapped it around the sleeping girl, as much as it would wrap. The girl shone through it like the sun through leaves.'